We've got transcription, media lock, and remote interpreting. Fantastic. Couldn't be better. You never hide who suppliers are, regardless if they are agencies or freelancers. And welcome to episode 83 of Slater Pod. Today, without Esther, but with me, your guest host, Florian. So... We have on the program today a fantastic guest, Ivan Smolnikov, the CEO of SmartCat, one of the most interesting companies in the space, most interesting language technology company in the industry. But before that, bear with me for a few announcements around our upcoming SlaterCon conference, which I really want to share with you. Lots of interesting guests, lots of interesting speakers, and of course, the usual amazing platform that we're using, Hopin. But... First, basically, we have Joshua Gold, the CEO of The Big Word. Uh, you know, The Big Word, while we were away, they uh, got a new majority shareholder, a private equity firm that invested. So Joshua is going to talk to us about four decades working with the government, lessons for the language industry. Really looking forward to that. Then we're heading over to Pinterest. Francesca DiMarco, internationalization lead at Pinterest, is going to tell us more about how they built an internationalization team to drive global strategy. Then a quick break where you guys can network, you know, we have a booth, exhibitions, the whole remote experience and um, looking forward to that and the whole, um, the networking, kind of the networking roulette thing, which uh, which I made a lot of great connections uh, at the last couple of Slater cons. Then we got Yara Tal, CF Blend, continuing and uh, talking about cross-border e-commerce growth, best practices from leading brands. I'll be moderating the content creation in the age of AI panel with uh, Konstantin Sevenkov of Intento, Jochen Hommel of Corion and his team, Michael Lopez of uh, E2F. And then a special treat, the panel on video localization. I think we found an amazing lineup of panelists really covering the three core areas that we had in our video localization report, which we spoke about last time, kind of takes a bit of a broader look at... Um, you know, the audiovisual localization space. So we got Farda Sabithian from Kudo, the CEO. We have Chris Reynolds, the executive vice president, general manager of Deluxe, one of the biggest um, media localizers, and Tom Liven, the founder and CEO of Verbit, uh, who raised a ton of money recently, uh, more in the transcription space. So we got transcription, media lock, and remote interpreting. Fantastic. Couldn't be better. And obviously, three uh, amazing experts there. Then we are moving on to game localization with Sarkhan Lyutfaliev, the global director of localization at Riot Games. Uh, looking forward to that, closing the conference on a, you know, funny note with game localization. So um, really, uh, really looking forward to that. And then Andrew's closing the conference and then there's going to be, you know, networking, exhibition, session rooms, etc. So... Without further ado, um, head over there, sign up September 8th, and with even less ado, I'll bring you Ivan Smolnikov, CEO of SmartCat, in just a couple of seconds. And welcome back to Slater Pod. Today with Ivan Smolnikov here, CEO of SmartCat. Hi, Ivan. Thanks, Florian. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. Great to have you here, Ivan. So where in the world does this podcast find you today? Boston, uh, where I live. And uh, during this uh, crazy months recently, almost didn't travel. Yeah, same here, same here. I'm doing domestic tourism like I've never done it before. I've, I'm discovering yeah. my country. <laughs> in, in the US, you know, what, what is great is like lots of opportunities to travel across the country and you don't really need to go somewhere. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I sometimes I, I wonder, you know, how it would fare if I was uh, back in Singapore where I used to live for some time. It's like, okay, you're in this mm -hmm. little island forever. Uh, anyway, yeah, you're in the US. Nice island. Nice island. It's a nice <laughs> island, but, you know, you get to the end of it at some point. <laughs> All right. All right. So Boston. So, um, yeah, so I, I said before, I think SmartCat is one of the most interesting companies in the language industry. So wh why don't you tell us a bit more first about your background, like how you got into this? Uh, I think you, you were originally a founder of an LSP as well, right? So just tell us a bit more about your background, how you got started in this industry and how you started SmartCat. 
how, how I started in the industry is still a mystery for me because I graduated in like physics and technology, was really doing hardcore research in physics. Uh, was uh, internship was uh, with Samsung in Korea, then in Canada, and then somehow I found myself uh, building the online translation ag agency. It was like 2003, I guess. Uh, and at the time, we didn't have yet uh, companies such as Gengo or Van Al Translation or you name it, like all these online companies that are today quite still quite popular. Uh, but at the time, we were building a company like that. Uh, it was out of Moscow. And just after two years, I sold uh, a portion of that company to Abbey Group. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, I still, I continued running that company for another 10 years. It was t 2006, I think, yeah, another 10 years until 2016. The name of the company was uh, AB Language Solutions. Still owned uh, a fair portion of the company and was running it very independently inside of AB Group and grew it into top 50 by CSA. And the company is still around. Uh, it was rebranded into Avatera uh, after I left the company. Right. And it's still the kind of one of the largest in Europe uh, and in top 50, maybe top 60. I don't know exactly, honestly, because haven't been doing anything with that business for last five years now. So pretty long history in the industry. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, I think you must be one of the first, if not the first, like math, science, physics, uh, PhD on this podcast because usually people come in from some random language angle or maybe some industry angle but not really from <laughs> from this Th that's why from, I'm saying it's still yeah. surprising to me <laughs> how well, did it happen but you know <laughs> it's happening <laughs> I guess I pretty it, much like it <laughs> it should give you a competitive advantage uh, when when maybe when you uh, get into the tech side of things so I guess that's why you also then did decide to go more tech with, with smart cat so just Tell yeah. us the, the origin story, the elevator pitch, how it um, I, got started. I, I think that's uh, the, 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 you're right. I, I always gravitated towards like uh, building something uh, on technology side. And my LSP company was also very much technology uh, powered uh, LSP back then. And then, uh, you know, just I found myself at some point understanding that probably you can't do that much with just a uh, traditional LSP approach that I wanted. And that's how Smartcat idea was born probably in 2015, 2016. Uh, the idea was literally to build a new type of SaaS platform that solves. Back then, I was thinking like about two major problems, maybe three. First was to give SaaS platform to everyone without really charging them for licenses on per user basis, because I really feared all the time and still think that it's pretty much diminishing for the industry to sell and charge per seat because we all deal with freelancers and you never know how many you will need tomorrow. Second was that idea of combining SaaS platform with marketplace of suppliers both freelancers and agencies and uh, the idea was that sourcing freelancers even back then with my agency was always tedious because we i, I remember we dealt like maybe with 2000 people all around the globe mm. and uh, sourcing them testing them verifying them was always kind of a big big thing uh, very time consuming very labor consuming consuming expensive uh, and that problem i felt and uh, that's one of our key focuses at the moment I felt we could save, uh, solve for the industry much better, not just this catalog of freelancers, but rather this combination of SaaS and marketplace of suppliers where we know much more about each supplier than you can read in the CVs because the, we know their performance, we know how they really deliver timely or not, we know the real feedbacks from the customers, uh, how the customers are satisfied, and ultimately we can tell you if a supplier is a fit for particular content and that's one of our key technologies in our backend today and third problem was actually payments uh, with like dealing with 2000 people all, all around the globe i remember we had a team of people who were really managing these payments through different payment methods so that freelancers are happy uh, and not you know disappointed with us sending them wire transfers uh, and they just losing like 10 percent of uh, the the money so these three prob problems kind of motivated me to start building SmartCAD back in 2015, 2016. 
and in 2016 uh, I set it up and raised my first money like seed money and then another round in the US in 2018 and then the last round uh, six seven months oh come on it's what was almost a year yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> it it's was uh, September September August 2020 yeah so we got the no seeds we got which we will talk about kind of the sourcing of the the freelancers the linguists and the payments component right which was uh, which is a core uh, differentiator for is there any part of your business that's kind of services revenue where you actually deliver the service to a client or is it is it just platform i mean quote unquote just platform um it's both. Uh, we don't deliver service as an agency uh, in in the traditional way, but you can you can really buy services from us uh, through our platform. The difference is that you always know transparently who suppliers are. We never hide who suppliers are, regardless if they are agencies or freelancers. As a buyer, and buyer can be also both agencies and freelancers. You always know who your suppliers are you literally call them my team inside of our platform and that helps you to really convey the signal about what you want from them uh, uninterrupted uh, because usually through the long supply chain when it's like large agency then small agency then freelancers real producers they never get actually the actual signal from a customer again mm -hmm. and can't communicate back effectively in our case it's all open it's all transparent all the time and uh, you as a buyer also see uh, rates of all suppliers and you can see how much you spend and you can optimize that. You can juggle suppliers quickly with just a couple of, uh, you know, clicks because you don't have a obstacle, a barrier to switch to another supplier. Uh, it's never like that. It's easy. You can just really do a couple of clicks and you can start working with a new supplier. But at the same time, you accumulate data inside of your account transition is smooth and quick and it's a single agreement so it's definitely a new model for the industry because from one hand you have convenience of a single agreement like if would <coughs> excuse me if you would work with uh, one large agency <coughs> but at the same time you have this convenience of having all the marketplace in front of you all the suppliers you can choose them easily and quickly you can optimize your cost, you can optimize quality, you can train people and they are motivated to really be educated by you because they have these kind of direct relationships. And they, these relationships perceived as direct, but it's just coming through a single agreement, which is an agreement with SmartCAD. But SmartCAD wouldn't have like a project management team that would help facilitate no. that, right? Basically the client, no. that's the, the platform part. So you wouldn't get yeah. like that. Okay, yeah, got it. Yeah, but at the same time, look, there are two components uh, of it. First, LSP is for sure they do the project management on their own. And customers, I see they, they tend to have someone who is doing some part of project management, but at the same time, step by step, uh, we are really automating project management. And that's good both for LSPs and then customers, because for LSPs, it's the second largest cost after they pay to freelancers. Mm. And we really make project managers like three times more productive. For end customers, once they integrate this platform, all the process is just continuous delivery. They don't do essentially any project management because it's kind of automatic, including selection and management of suppliers. Technology does it. Got it. So you, you basically have three stakeholders here that are working on the platform. So it's the, the enterprise, right? It's the freelance linguists, and then it's the language service providers, both as... Um, in a sense, a resource if a, like an enterprise client chooses to work with a particular agency or, or bring their own kind of be bring their own agency to to the project, or LSPs that actually are using SmartCAD as their kind of TMS solution, right? And yeah. then we mentioned the freelance. <laughs> Just tell us a bit more about that dynamics here. This must be kind of complicated because there's some competitive elements in there. Again, the transparency, like LSPs don't like when people see their like which end suppliers they're using, etc. I mean must be quite a, a complex uh, yeah. ecosystem. It's very handle. complex. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's kind of um, both exciting and complicated part of what we are doing uh, because we need to, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we need to go through this complexity all the time. We need to align interests of stakeholders. We need to optimize product for them. 
and uh, I can talk a lot about it. So if you feel like it's a bit redundant, please stop me. But uh, please, in a nutshell, we have all the time in the world. Uh, uh, <laughs> in a nutshell, it's like that. First, if a buyer chooses to work with an agency, agency is not forced to open the supply chain. They can still work with freelancers and buyer won't know it. It's just a choice for both an agency and the buyer how to do that. And we see many buyers just work with freelancers directly on our platform. And I think that that's because we do solve this problem of uh, having not having multiple contracts and multiple invoices but we provide them with um, the benefits of dealing with freelancers such as quality and transparency and everything but it's it's uh, at the same time many buyers still prefer and come or combine working with agencies and freelancers and that's good as well because for some complex big projects agencies can do a better job and they are more qualified they have some additional layer of expertise and that's a combination which is kind of liberating for buyers because uh, they can't, they can, they can now afford dealing with like ten or twenty or sometimes fifty suppliers. Sometimes we see buyers localizing into twenty languages, and they have ten agencies and you know sixty freelancers working all together in combination, depending on the language pair and uh, complexity of the project. So we really do our best to align interests here and not to have any competition and for agencies what is great uh, in our platform first they do use us as all-in-one tms platform and that's pretty unique uh, usually you need to combine cat platform and tms product and these two never really work efficiently together because uh, of different limitations uh, in integration between traditional business or translation management systems and CAD platforms. <clears throat> and if you have this limitation in integration, you can't actually build effective continuous delivery process because this continuous delivery actually stops on this integration. Mm -hmm. You need to transfer data manually and that's where you have this waste of project management effort. We combine that in, in a single platform. We provide them with all connectors, integrations, all on, 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 single, on a single platform. They can use it either for free or they can buy a subscription which is flat and independent on number of users. And that's a big, big benefit for them because they save a lot of money. They save a lot of project management efforts. They can optimize cost on suppliers thanks to our marketplace where we have 450,000 now freelancers in different language pairs. So a lot of benefits having all on a single platform. And then they can go and buy uh, and sell to, to buyers their services more effectively uh, because they are now much more effective themselves. Also, we have this partnership program for them where they can resell SmartCat to their buyers. And in this case, they don't have technology cost at all. If your buyer is, is on SmartCat, you don't have technology cost with SmartCat at all. That's kind of beneficial for them. Got it. So 450,000, that's like all of them. <laughs> uh, I think <laughs> maybe half of them, <laughs> okay. but we'll see. You know, we're adding 10,000 more every month organically. So <laughs> I, I, I don't know when it's going to stop, but 10,000 10, consistently every month without any uh, advertising budget. Two things I want to talk about now. Like first, just briefly subscriptions, but then also uh, payments. So you mentioned subscriptions. How do you manage that? Like we, we, we've spoken about translation as a subscription in, in previous podcast segments. Like, uh, is it a certain upper limit? Do people then max this out consistently? Or like, isn't it very hard to sell translation as a subscription? And, and how do you manage that? Um, good question. We don't sell services as a uh, subscription. Uh, in our case, uh, it's also a pretty sophisticated model, but I think that that's our competitive advantage as well. Uh, subscription, first, we have very powerful freemium component. Any user can use us for free. For freelancers, we don't have subscriptions at all. For agencies and end customers, we have very large limit of what we call today smart words. And what is smart words? Uh, smart words is essentially automatic translation, which we do for you. You can use it or you can avoid it. It's up to you. So if you don't use automatic translation that comes from SmartCat, 
you can avoid pay, uh, paying a subscription whatsoever. And all other features, everything is available, no limitation on number of projects, users, you name it. Got it. So just let me pause you for a second. I get it. So you're basically not, or I mean, the limit for routing content through SmartCut is very, very high until you actually get charged for the tech. But of course, you still have to pay the supplier for the service. Yeah, absolutely. Got it. Okay. And you, you see they cost, as I said, transparently on the marketplace. And then you can, you know, kind of pick them for a particular project. You can combine your supply chain and you can modify it on the go, essentially, dynamically with any project. Because it's not, you know, you, you're, not lo you're not locked in as a buyer on a single supplier for another 12 or 24 months after you have just uh, run RFP process. And that's the beauty of it. But in, uh, after that, you pay for all suppliers' services with a single invoice at the end of the month with like Net30, Net45, depending on how you choose it. And this invoice actually accumulates all supplier costs that you had in the previous months. It can be one supplier or 100 suppliers. How hard is that to pull off on the back end? Like just logistically for you guys? I mean, oh. just, okay, the pulling together the invoice, I can, I guess that's partially a challenge, but... Doing the payments, like, how, how does that work? The, the, these are these are like literally three different products under the hood. First is a TMS, but it's not just a standard TMS. It has complexity of what you said, three different target audiences. And for all of them, what we are aiming to achieve is all-in-one platform. So we solve all your problems. If you're on SmartCat, you don't need to actually use other technologies such as additional TMS platform for, I don't know, managing your customers, or you don't need to use additional CAD platform. So that's one part of complexity. Second part is marketplace itself. And marketplace is not just a listing of freelancers or agencies. It's not just static profiles. It's actually connected to this TMS platform and TMS platform feeds these profiles with real actual performance data. And based on this actual performance data, we can match you automatically with best suppliers, not just based on language pair, but on content domain, actually. And so when you upload some specific document, we can tell you who are the best suppliers from English into German in this specific domain field. Mm. Th that's another thing. And marketplace complexity and matching technology, it's a big thing. It's a separate big team inside of SmartCat. And that marketplace works for all parties as well. It's like for end buyers, for agencies, and for freelancers. Freelancers are only consumers. Agencies are both on both sides. They are consuming marketplace and they are participants of the marketplace themselves. And end buyers are just buying from marketplace. And there is third fintech product. And that's like literally different product we can charge you in any currency in any country with a single invoice for example we can we can give you invoice in japanese yena in japan and you will pay with this invoice for 100 suppliers spread across the globe and these suppliers will go to their uh, personal account in smartcat they choose their preferred payment method which would allow them to withdraw money from SmartCat in their currency and with their preferred method in their country. And that's <laughs> additional big thing. And it's also connected with TMS platform because TMS platform feeds it with uh, billing data. Uh, otherwise, you won't be able to accumulate into a single invoice every month. Maybe just a, like a strange question, but like, are you exposed to any currency risks or something? Or are you like settling this daily? Or, or how does that work? Sorry, I'm... I'm Quite uh, it's it, it's not a big deal for us at all because as a supplier you can choose to get money in US dollars regardless where you are right and if a buyer pays uh, with US dollars here you can you can mitigate your currency risks on your own let's put it this way Got it. Uh, but uh, in case of uh, withdrawing money how it happens usually it's pretty straightforward if as a buyer you just paid someone in US dollars then we will convert it into your domestic currency if you prefer to withdraw it in your domestic currency in the moment of your withdrawal. Hmm. So essentially, you, you, you see this exchange rate at the moment of your withdrawal. So uh, we, we, we have never experienced any, any losses or issues with that. Let's put it this way. Got it. And now you have years of like data, so probably not something that's going to blindside you at some point. 
Um, hey, marketplaces. So nobody has managed to, I think what you call a horizontal platform, no horizontal platform has kind of ever managed to crack translation localization. We had this pro finder by LinkedIn. Uh, I think there was uh, Upwork, tried it at some point um, earlier. Like why don't these large um platforms manage to crack translation well, what do you think what's the key or the top three reasons why they failed so far uh i think that's i can i can tell you top one reason for that and yeah. maybe we can then come up with uh, a couple more <laughs> if, if sure. you need to but the top one reason is the following uh the catalog of suppliers doesn't present value for enterprise buyers because as an enterprise buyer to deal with this variety of suppliers, you need a technology, you need technology around it, which is very powerful and very vertical and specific. You can't just go away effectively with just, I don't know, project management tool together with a catalog of freelancers or agencies. Because first you need to automate this whole workflows, how you exchange content and how it works. You need this automatic translation component in it, which we call smart words, and it combines all best machine translation engines, translation memory, glossary management, all QA checks on top of it, right? That's the number one core value that any buyer in this industry, including enterprises and agencies want to see, right? Second, Catalog of freelancers won't help you uh, if you need to source, select, and test these freelancers yourself. Yeah. So you need you need technology to be not just integrated with this uh, workflow TMS platform, but also help you to source and verify these suppliers. Otherwise, you do it yourself, and then w w what is the point, right? Then uh, that's what you pay usually agency for to do it for you, right? And that's when you have both pros and cons of this uh, standard model. So if you don't combine catalog of suppliers with vertical software that automates the entire workflow plus sourcing and testing and payments, that doesn't present significant value for enterprises. And that's why no horizontal uh, catalogs of freelancers were successful in this industry. Is there is there an example of like where it really worked? I mean, for example, on Upwork, which are some of the most? Would you know like which ones are the most popular categories that actually work on such a engineers, more, engineers, software engineers? Yeah, interesting. It's uh, it's it's because the workflows for engineers are so different, and uh, as as a buyer, you don't need actually uh, anything uh, except for just uh, talent yeah. to really to re to really make it work. But in, in, in case of our industry, it's very different, actually. And um, yeah, so I, I, maybe also it's kind of close to successful with our designers. Yeah, I but should, uh, other than that, for enterprise, it's not really uh, going very well. I need to get your designer. Your design is fantastic, like with the lock from home and just the, the, the general, like even the website. Uh, I, I'm I'm not happy with okay. how ours is. I need to I need to step it up. Um, <laughs> he will enjoy your comment, I'm sure. <laughs> no, seriously, it's so clean. It's 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 very very well done. So f from the matching perspective, that that's super hard. Kind of the the project management part there. You you got those hundreds of thousands of of freelancers. How do you how do you a qualify and vet them like at scale in production and then uh, what are some of the key issues there? I mean, this is you know from my time at, at an LSP. I mean, it's always like it, it's one of the hardest things to do. Like you find a qualified person, that person then tends to get very busy. You can't use them anymore for a particular project because they're booked out on something else. Yeah, yeah. that's exactly the problem we are solving. Yeah. They are right. And uh, again, both for agencies and uh, and end customers, because agencies really appreciate that component. They are always in the situation when they have some projects that don't have enough uh, freelancers. They are always in the situation when uh, they have a new project for a new customer and they just don't know where to source freelancers for them. And in our case, uh, look, there, this this is multi-layer technology, and that's where I think we apply to the uh, machine learning or you can call it AI the most. It actually starts from just basic things such as language pair and say number of words on our platform in the uh, same domain field. And the main field on this layer can be just something that customer identified uploading the content 
and freelancer indicated in the profile, then rates should be matched. Uh, I mean, it should be in your budget, right? Uh, and we look into customer feedbacks, which we accumulate as well. But after that, we can go into another layer where we can actually analyze the main field of the content. If you upload the content, in reality, there is no such domain as legal, just pure legal. It's legal for something, right? Hmm. If you if you have a contract for oil and gas station, that's very different uh, from your contract when you invest when you invest money in the company. The the voc vocabulary very, will be very different. It will be like two two totally different type of contents. So this legal doesn't help a lot, and that's where we help both enterprises and project managers inside of an agency to really understand what is inside of this content and who are the best freelancers who really translated before similar content and successfully. So these two things are very important and they are p purely technology based, uh, which is similar content, which means that we can analyze a kind of semantic field of this content and can tell you it's not just about legal, but it's about specific terminology which prevails in, in the original content. And here is freelancer who did similar content successfully five times before in this language pair and successfully that's not just based on the customer feedbacks it's probably also based on number of transactions to this freelancer if a freelancer retains a customer for like 15 months and this is reputable customer that means something right yeah we don't we don't uncover this data because it's confidential as well as content itself but based on our technology we can tell you who is the best candidate for that and and that's very valuable got it got it hey on the other end of the extreme if somebody actually just wanted to like an enterprise client if they wanted to translate edit everything in country review everything by themselves is that something that they could oh. do and how, how often do you see them actually wow. trying to that's do this that's a great question huh? great question you know uh, with all that experience I had in the industry, it was surprising to me to see last two years how many buyers actually start just editing content themselves. Wow. So post-editing uh, from the MT or? Yeah, it's, uh, that's what we call smart words. And yeah. look, the, the difference with just raw MT is, there are many differences, but in a nutshell, we combine multiple different MT engines plus translation memory. Mm -hmm. So you always get completely automatic translation with SmartCAD. You can, you can actually, you can, you can opt not to have it, but by default, you Th always, always will have automatic translation from SmartCAD. Segments never empty, basically by default. Never. Yeah. Yes, by yeah. default. And that's a combination of translation memory and MT and it always learns from what how you edit it, right? Uh, it's not uh, exchanged across accounts because it's because of confidentiality. But inside of your account, we always learn from your content, and you can upload more content, or we can crawl your website and help you to build translation memory from scratch. It depends, but it's always populated in with, with pre-translation. And the thing is that the quality of this automatic translation is always growing, and surprisingly for me. Uh, a lot of enterprises during the last probably like year and a half or two years found that for many content types, they don't need to outsource it anymore. Wow. They just go with the internal reviewers who are the in-country marketing content writers or marketing managers, whoever. And for some type of content, they just do reviewing themselves. It, it doesn't mean that they stop outsourcing at all. And I want to believe, and I think it's true, that they don't even reduce their budget because overall they still want to spend their budget because they have more content they, they, they could afford otherwise. But for some portions of content, they can either use automatic translation without any editing now, or they really go with uh, what we call insourcing. They mm. edit content inside of uh, the company. And with market, it's easy once again because we don't count seats. We can allow you either do it internally with unlimited number of users. You can send invites to like thousands of people in your company and we don't charge you a penny for that. That's that's convenient, right? And that's the difference. Second, that you can invite uh, your volunteers or users. Sometimes we see people invite the users and they really do reviewing for them for free. And you can do standard model. You can invite agencies you worked with before 
you can invite freelancers you knew or you can go to our marketplace so generally it's like four different options with SmartCat how you can proceed with editing or consuming the automatic translation so it's that theory that basically as you're lowering the hurdle for interacting with mt maybe the budgets i mean I guess as an industry, we should hope the budgets overall don't get cut, but just the amount of content that gets localized just expands so much more, right? And probably the quality for the user, at, and not, not the smart cat user, but the eventual kind of the person consuming the content gets better and better and better. Like with Canva, design just got so much better over the fa past five years because everybody could use these kind of tools. Now with translation as well, it just grows the pie of good, well-translated content. Absolutely. And uh, that's what I'm seeing. And that's what I hoped for back like five years ago when I started SmartCat. And that's what I'm seeing today is that, and, and that's why I believe that agencies and freelancers shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't worry actually, shouldn't be scared of automation because the total amount of work which is being outsourced is not reducing, is not, is not shrinking. That's, that's what I see at least because we as 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 a, as humanity as 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 uh, the uh, business world we produce more and more content Indeed. in my opinion content becomes kind of driving force for sales and marketing i see that sales and marketing kind of converge into you know content strategy content management content delivery and specifically it seems like it's it accelerated with covid because you don't need this field presence anymore in different countries and you can just go with effective content strategies and what it means is that you always have like 10x or sometimes 100x more content in your company that you would like to localize than your budget can afford and that's the problem so it's not a problem of you know shrinking budgets it's about having more content translate it in different ways automatic a little bit edited by users or your employees edited with high quality level by professional uh, linguists and agencies etc when you started i think you weren't fully like five years ago you weren't fully focused on the enterprise is, is that is that correct was it mostly like you transitioned into the enterprise over the past like three four years more or less right look uh it's not uh, we we haven't we didn't experience any change in our strategy it's just mm -hmm. about that problem of platform complexity when you have three distinct target audiences and you actually developed under the develop under the hood three different products for them it's hard it's you hard. just can't you know you, you can't address it all yeah. simultaneously and that's why i think that we, we started not even with product for agencies but we started with product for freelancers yeah we first got traction with freelancers because the simple cat product back in 2016 was enough for them and that's how we populated our marketplace and then we went to agencies and said look guys we have this nice product and freelancers and also we are building payment component would you like to try it and then i would say in other next f two to three years after 2016 uh, we were focused primarily on agencies you're right but we never we never kind of, you know, uh, ran away from, from enterprises. We always had enterprises as our customers, but we didn't do any marketing for them. We didn't uh, develop specific features for them. And then maybe end of 2019, beginning of 2020, that's where we added more resources into both our product development and marketing for enterprises because we already felt like both freelancers and agencies products they were mature enough to allow us to focus more on enterprises at the same time it was always hundreds of enterprise customers i mean i was also asking because you the, the freelancers probably they i mean they found you like on their own almost i mean there's there's probably a fair amount of of, of push from your side as well but it, it's fairly automatic then the the lsps are easier to find right you go to a slater con you go to a gala you go to a lock world maybe but selling to the enterprise is is very very hard and different and complex i mean how did you find the sales and marketing effort um when you're getting into this in this vast vast field of the enterprise which is literally any company on the planet right 
First, we are still learning that. I, I can't, uh, honestly can't boast here that we are absolutely correct to that and we know how to do that at scale super effectively. Second, uh, you know, I think that uh, as well as we are probably not yet uh, super uh, cool and super effective with our marketing, I should admit that. I believe so. I think that we have huge room for improvement, even though uh, thanks for, for your compliment. Look, our, no, come on, you website. guys were the first ones to do a remote conference. Like I was like, oh no, <laughs> like it was April. The largest 20 one, you know, that, that was surprising, right? Yeah, like, it was like April 2020. <laughs> I'm like, was... aren't we supposed to be the conference guys? And then you guys came in with like lock promo. Like, it, right. was, it was a great <laughs> idea of our marketing team. I really yeah. enjoyed it. And uh, for me, it was specifically great. And we are a bit derailing from your question, but we will we'll get back. It was like, uh, I, I, I didn't even come up with this idea. It was entirely, you know, from our marketing team. And I was like, okay, are you guys going to make to the Gmode conference, right? Uh, we used to travel to conferences. Yeah, we will do that. And that was just one month after lockdown. Absolutely. And it was so early. It was 2,500 20, 20, attendees uh, <laughs> and like, uh, I think 4,000 or 5,000 5, something uh, registered yeah. people and 2,400 attendees most of them or at least half of them were simultaneously present uh, in a single room which wow. was essentially the largest conference and we we, are, we, are, we, we keep growing since then uh, so it was good that was but, good that's uh, good marketing st st yeah st <laughs> there are some some bright bright steps for sure yeah. but still i believe we have huge room for improvement in our marketing and enterprise sales but back to your question i think what we are doing differently and what we are doing good and this is not marketing and enterprise sales. What we do here good is product-led growth. It's about us having really good quality, easy to use, effective product that anyone can start using for free. And that creates pretty large funnel of users of all types for us, including enterprises today. And also our product, our design, which doesn't uh, push you to buy and pay for any user, assumes easy sharing. Mm -hmm. So viral acquisition also works for us. It's not, there is no, uh, there are no obstacles for you as an end buyer if you jump on the platform and have just translated a single file for you automatically to then share it with your colleagues quickly and then invite an agency that you knew before, and then an agency will invite 100 freelancers, or these freelancers then will bring a couple of agencies they knew, and, and, and so on and so forth. So this viral acquisition loops still work for us, and I can't say that they work as effectively are, uh, for end buyers as they work for freelancers and agencies, but still it generates quite a lot of uh, end customer acquisition for us today. And I think we primarily continue kind of focusing and doubling down on this product-led growth component where we have powerful product, a lot of value, easy sharing, and uh, that's something that we believe in quite strongly. But at the same time, we do want to strengthen our enterprise sales and marketing in parallel but that's kind of work in progress. Is that where some of the, the venture funding is going into as well? I mean, you raised three times, you mentioned, and the most recent one, again, was about, about a year ago. Maybe if you can speak a little bit to just raising from VCs, how, how is the environment? I guess, yeah, you raised still post-pandemic. Just like, how is that? How are the dynamics? How do the, the VCs that you speak to perceive kind of the language industry at large as well? Um, first, I think that raising in the language industry is harder than just in like, um, in, in probably some other software industries, because I think for many VCs, it's still lots of unknowns. Like what is, what is about this large industry? How really you can create such a value that we will, would allow you not necessarily in our case to compete with agencies directly. We, we are not. AI agency whatsoever, but to provide value that would allow to accumulate both buyers and suppliers on a single platform and leverage from how they essentially transact between each other. 
so from one hand, that's very appealing and interesting and intriguing strategy for for VCs as well. And for me personally, that's why I'm pursuing it. And I believe it creates lots lots of value for the world and for both uh, buy side and supply side. From another hand, you're totally right. And that's something we discussed today. It's hard. It's complicated. And in addition to this complexity, this language industry, which is very fragmented, like tens of thousands of agencies, right? And uh, they're all scattered all around the globe. Uh, we don't know how many buyers are out there. So it's kind of pretty uh, wake for them. And that, that makes fundraising harder. Mm -hmm. During the COVID, I think fundraising was hard for, for literally every startup. It's kind of improved. It, it's accelerated for some companies such as fintech companies, pure fintechs, for example. But for majority, it was harder than before. And uh, it's kind of blossomed again, maybe six months ago in the US. But we raised, uh, it was kind of in the middle of pandemic. So it was really hard. Yeah, there were back to your question about where, where, where money goes. There you go ahead. Not, not yet for sales and marketing. That's why I'm saying that still big room for improvement. Uh, we have 150 people uh, on board today uh, in house. I mean, full time uh, in place. And more than 50% of them are in, are in the product. Uh, so they are in engineering, product management, um, data analytics. But uh, sales and marketing is, uh, these are very small teams at the moment, like literally tiny. Got it. So let's close on like industry outlook, but also your roadmap. So next two to three years, where, where do you see SmartCat going? Where do you see the industry at large going? If you have a view on that. What we see as our major value and where we go is that um, we see that enterprises really can get all technologies in a single platform. Not necessarily all of them are developed by SmartCat, but we accumulate lots of interesting technologies under the hood, such as all MT engines. We are thinking of integrating some um, content analysis uh, engines such as uh, JPT3, etc. Uh, so we see this smart words component as something that allows you to process content automatically and then uh, decide if you want to edit this content at all. And that's not necessarily about translation. It can be the content in the original language. We can process speech to text, for example, and then allow you to edit or not. Or we can uh, help you to, I don't know, improve your original content with JPT-3 and uh, then process it via machine translation, which seems to be promising for support teams, for example. And that's one of our core components. And then we add two more components that we see are valuable for enterprises and they are already incorporated into the platform. First is this selective editing workflows. You can either go with your own team or you can invite suppliers you know or you can source automatically through our large marketplace of agencies and freelancers, and that creates lots of flexibility. And third, you can you can deal with all that via single contract with one invoice at the same time, benefiting from dealing with all these suppliers kind of directly because you see their rates, you, you can communicate to them, but contractual uh, paperwork, invoicing, it's all kind of removed out of your... Uh, your responsibilities. So these three components we see as major benefit for all enterprises in addition to integrations, you know, this IT, IT compliance, data security and procurement compliance. That's all kind of incorporated already. And where we go is that we strengthen this automatic language processing component and make uh, sourcing and um, vetting human resources, including agencies or freelancers, doesn't matter, more and more robust so that you don't need to think who are the best people who can do it for you. You can just click a button and it works. That, that's where we go. Uh, and in terms of the industry, I think that inevitably we go all into that combination of uh, automatic language processing and then human workflows. And I think that that's one thing. Another, another thing is that uh, service providers who really do lots of manual work, they are not really competitive today and yeah. they should think about it. And, and this manual work comes not necessarily from things they are thinking about first, such as machine translation. That comes from managing files uh, manually with, with help of the project managers. 
not integrating with content management systems and really exchanging documents manually with their customers, then transferring files inside of the internal systems between TMS and CAD, then sending files to freelancers, that all consumes lots of money and time. And that's not competitive today, and that won't be competitive tomorrow. I'm kind of very confident about it. And I think that the best way to go is to really automate all of that and to become expert consultant or selling force for your customer, helping them to really make right choices with their content, choosing what needs to be automatically translated or localized or transformed somehow, what do doesn't, doesn't need to be uh, transformed at all, and what needs to be edited and how. That still requires some, you know, strategy, some thinking and some um help from from experts yeah and that's where we enable i think lots of benefits for agencies as well so they can kind of resell platform becoming our partners and then automate everything on it and become trusted advisors for their customers seeing how it all goes on autopilot so that's my view at least for how it's going to evolve in the next couple of years but i would avoid you know giving forecast for more than two three years yeah because uh, it's, it's 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 too far who knows we just got hit by or not just but you know what if covid 2022 <laughs> god forbid comes around so um yeah. thanks ivan that was that was super interesting thanks so much for uh for uh taking the time today hope we can catch up in real thanks life at some me. point when the us opens up i'll be over there yeah, absolutely. And in the US, it's kind of very, very comfortable these days. I, I hope that it's not going back, but it, it might, it might actually go yeah. back. This, yeah, well, they, uh, they don't Delta allow variant. us over there yet. I think I just listened to a podcast yesterday where one guy said he had to fly to Turkey, like a UK citizen, flew to Istanbul for two weeks so he could then travel to Texas. <laughs> you, can, you can fly to Moscow. And yeah. then you can fly from Moscow to New York. Uh, still, there is direct flight and uh, it, it works. It makes no sense. Yeah, the, the Schengen area is still <laughs> not allowed to travel. Anyways, all right. Well, thanks so much, Ivan. Uh, Thank you. Let's catch up soon. Bye. Absolutely. Thank you.